Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Magia Mindset. Today's guest was the first African American to play for Furman University, has had a professional playing career in the United States, had had professional coaching stints with the Portland Timbers as an assistant coach, Sacramento Republic as an assistant coach, had had professional stints in Trinidad and Tobago, also in Jamaica. Please welcome Rod Underwood. Roll the intro. Rod, thank you so much for putting the time to come in. I know your schedule's busy and slowly things are opening up as well. So especially in the coaching world and the sports world, things are getting more busy, busy, busy because of just managing and planning and organizing things. That's, um, it's hopefully heading in the right direction. So yeah. again, how are, how are things for you? How, how are things down there in California? How's things going? Things are good. Things are good. Um, LA County doesn't open up till August. Uh, oh, wow, really? Yeah, so in competition, Orange County has opened up. So there's sections within SoCal that are opening up, but it's, it's mainly opening up for private training, group training. So I think a lot of the coaches maybe that are in the club world, maybe non that, might end up starting – connections with individuals that want to if it's elite level groups of three maybe it's college level that you want to work with whoever it is um that's what it leans towards i think when we get back into our cycle especially if you're on the lower end if you're not the funded professional clubs um you just don't have the resources and things can get complicated like if i'm not affiliated with the professional if it's not my college if it's not the professional club situation. I would rather do the privates than go back into the cycle because it's a lot of headaches, meaning that you might do uh, the right things of if it's liability forms, getting their thermometer LEDs. um, But, you know, there's still those one, two parents that are always going to cause situations. So as a coach, it kind of takes away from you training and you're more focused on uh, is everyone okay? Is everyone okay? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, up here, I mean, we. It's interesting in Washington because Washington, obviously, we. I mean, in the beginning of all this, back in like you know March, April, we were leading the charge of cases, right? We were leading the charge, and then New York just went off, went off, and got all the cases. So some of the some of the counties they're going county by county, much like in LA, where some counties are already in what you know, the government plan is phase two, where like where we live, there's the three major counties, us, which is Pierce County, King County, and Snohomish County, which is all in that Seattle area, which is in Cop- that, in- that includes the two largest cities, Tacoma and Seattle and everything in between there. Um, so they were supposed to go to phase two, which meant that teams and clubs could start training in groups of four. Um, Groups of four, groups of four, but in, in a sense, you could still train your whole team because you could just put a f- half a field in quadrants and do individual training with groups of fours. Coach stands in the middle. That was supposed to start next week, but now that's going to, looks like it's going to be another week off. But I think I can see us having some tournaments in July. I can see us in the tournament phase up here in July. You Do you think um... – I mean, I'm I'm more in SoCal, but you know, obviously, yeah. about Surf Cup. You think they're gonna go forward with that end of July? I heard surf was I, I, I heard today that Surf's a go. That's what I heard too. It's just to me that those are the situations where you're like, what do you do? What do you do? Because they're saying it go, and most likely between you and me, we know it's a business perspective. Um, yeah. it, you know, there, it's such a big uh, machine of uh, of a tournament. Yeah, right. they got to go forward and they got to find ways to go forward. But yeah. as a coach, you got to be like that one leader who steps in and like, you know what? 
this is not our year for that, depending on yeah. what age group you have. Like, like some of the ones that ask me if they have the younger teams or the older teams, it's like, if you have the younger team, what is it really going to benefit going to a serve cup, paying that much money this year? Maybe just some, you know, the local ones, but, but people are hungry for it. People are hungry for it, Rod. I mean, uh, if there's a green light, <laughs> there's maybe one or two parents that are like, I'm not okay with traveling, but majority are have knocked at the door saying that also, let's do it. Let's go. Yeah, so exactly. It's tough, man. It's tough how to manage um, the pendulum for both sides. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, I really think safety's got to be first, right? Um, but I can tell you, like, surf, for instance, as a, there's n- um, as a, um, I don't see any teams, maybe one or two, traveling to surf from Washington to play this summer. Uh, I know that most of the clubs have sort of made pacts that, in order to keep it financially viable, that, for instance, a crossfire said that we're going to send all of our teams to your tournament and return to send all our teams to this tournament just so that there can be some sorts of games, but also can you bring in the revenue. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. I think, look, and in, in the end of the day, especially if it's a smaller club that are not funded by an owner or anything like that, yeah, I think surf is one of the more expensive tournaments. If you're traveling out of state, I mean, a lot of the your parents are probably in employment situations as well during this yeah. time. You're coming back, so all of those considerations goes a long way for your team. And and most likely this year, because people are scared to traveling, you're not going to get the highest, usually the highest level at surf with people no. coming from Texas or internationals. Yeah. Like, Usually yeah, yeah. From internationals from Mexico and stuff coming in, you're probably not going to get that. So it does it, in all aspects, it just doesn't make sense, even though they're a go just yeah. because I mean, it's, it's one of those years yeah. that you can save up. Yeah. Internationally, I'm, I'm hearing that internationally that anybody, anybody from anywhere, pretty much it's a, it's a two week quarantine. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm hearing that if you're coming into the country, right. Wow. It's, it's a two-week quarantine, but I did hear some countries now have been able to. Uh, some countries that are opening up, they're now looking at a situation where they can do these sort of three-hour tests, where they can get the results back in three hours from people coming in. So basically, if you go into a particular country, you've got to sit in the airport for three hours so your test results come back. If they come back negative, you're good. If they come back positive, on a plane home or quarantine. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. So, hey, so Rod, let's kind of jump into it as we're transitioning from that to um, giving your story and okay. your journey. I think it's very, uh, I've, I've got bits of it from our last previous dialogues we've had. Right. Um, it's very intriguing. I think you have a very intriguing story. Your journey has been a, g- a great journey for uh, our audience to have a listen to as well, just to understand how you got to where you got to today and right. what made you become the coach that you are today uh, from your player journey, as well as your coach journey. And if you have any stories that kind of come up while you're explaining your journey, by all means, do not um, segue out of it if you feel like uh, there is a time constraint or anything like that. Right. I want you, I think sometimes the most beautiful things to listen to, it is the story part of it. So if anything comes up, elaborate uh, and we go from there. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of just start from the beginning. I mean, let's start from the end. Let's start from today. Today I'm 53 years old, right? So I've been involved in the game for uh over 45 years as a player as a coach so how did all that get started i mean it's a funky story how it got started basically we we were living in atlanta in the early 70s um and my neighbor his dad coached american football and his dad said you know you want to play football of course i mean that time there was baseball football basketball those were the sports right so uh, i said sure i'll play but there was a little 
caveat there that you had to weigh a certain amount to you had to be at a minimum weight to play on the team because at that time from understanding is that it had to be a minimum weight requirement to play tackle football uh, so I didn't weigh enough <laughs> so the next day um, or the next few days I went to school as a big sign up play soccer right never heard of the game never seen a soccer ball but I was at the age where I wanted to do something right and for my school and I said sure I'll do it we signed up and but now the issue is there's a need, need a coach nobody knows soccer right so my mom and her friend become the coaches right and we didn't know much about soccer I mean I remember like getting shoes that were football shoes uh football cleats right there was a company called Rydell I think they still make football helmets right so I had Rydell shoes I had shin pads that weren't really shin pads. They were like uh, like the soft, cushiony, old school knee pads. Uh, so those are the shin pads, and you wore and you wore knee pads at the time, right? Too. So you wore knee pads, shin pads, and the football cleats. That was how you played. Um, and really, from there, I mean, the game uh, really took off. I mean, we lived in that area, probably another. I don't know, maybe another couple of years. And then we moved into the suburbs because we were living in the city. So we moved to the suburbs um, and we joined the team at the YMCA, a place called the Snap Finger YMCA. Uh, and that's when I kind of had my first real coach. Uh, and we played, I mean, we played soccer and, you know, the coaches did the best that they could. And, uh, and then sort of fast forward to... And I was one of the better players, right? And then, you know, moving in, I left the YMCA and moved in at that time would have been called club soccer, but not to the extent that it is now, right? Um, I know the expense that it is now. So uh, year by year, I got better and better and better. And then growing, growing up in Atlanta, um, high school started in eighth grade. Where I went to school, there's no middle school. So you went elementary school first through seventh. And then high school, 8 through 12. So imagine a 12-year-old being in school with a, uh, with a senior that was 17 or 18. So kind of crazy, right? Um, but, and then if you, if you played high school as an 8th grader, you couldn't play your senior year. So I didn't play high school my 8th grade year. I stayed at my club and I ran track. And then my ninth grade year, a uh, guy by the name of Carl Rosenbaum picked me on the varsity. I was a ninth grader, um, and um, I played, and I started, and I met a few, met, you know, this, the, our school was really very good. They were coming off of, a, I think, a state championship in 80, when did they come off a championship? I think they came off a championship um, right, at like, like, maybe the year before I played. So they were a very good team. We had... So if you think about schools that players were going to, we had players going from that from my high school. So Clemson was a big thing at the time. It's still a big powerhouse. Duke. Um, during that time, during that time, how how vital was it being a freshman and making a varsity team? I think the landscape, as some of the audience sees it now, has changed. Can you kind of touch in how how big it was, um, you know, as a freshman, being able to start high school varsity and what, what the game was in the area that you were competing to? Well, you know, by that time, we talk about the landscape, right? We talk about the landscape of, of football in, in Atlanta at that time. We had the Atlanta Chiefs, right? So we had the NASL team. So we got, so now we, we had some understanding, right, uh, about the game. Uh, uh, you know, Pelé was coming through, Cruyff was coming through, Giorgio Canale was coming. So we were seeing all these guys, right? And, the, and, the, and then George Best, all these guys were coming through the city at that time. So we were learning the game. So um, I was the only freshman selected for the high school team. Uh, not only was I selected, I started um, as a freshman. So I was 13 or 14 playing with uh, 17, 18 year olds. Um, so I was, I was playing um, and starting and, you know, high school was high school was high school was really very big, right? Because I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah, high school at that time was bigger than club. It was bigger than club. It was you know you played for your high school, right? That was and it was unique at our school because we had um, we had a very good football 
football team, American football team, and they were state champions over time. We probably had from our, just from my time at the school, we probably had eight to 10 guys go to NFL. So that's how good the school was, right? So, and that was the time that Herschel Walker was coming through. So, and we were winning state championships or right about playing against people like that. So the high school football was really good. Soccer was was really good. Um, and, you know, really being a black kid at that time playing soccer was really unheard of. Very few black kids played soccer, especially if you were born and raised in America, right? So, I mean, you had some Africans maybe that were playing or Caribbeans that were playing, but no real born and bred in America playing soccer. So that was that was a unique situation. And still, I mean, I mean, the racism that you see now, I mean, the racism was, was worse growing up in the sense of growing up in the South, right? Um, so to be playing on a team with all white kids was not necessarily easy, but it's different in teams, right? Teams teams sort of just look at the players and teams sort of just say, we're just going to do our thing, right? So I never really, I personally never really experienced any racism from my teammates or anything like that. Uh, but we had a Jewish coach, so that really made it, he was, he was very cognizant of that, right? That he was, you know, not going to let those things go on if he, if he felt those. And he was, he was a, a fantastic guy. Um, and he, I think he had gone to George Washington University and played at George Washington University in D.C., so he had known the game, and um, all through high school, I mean, by the time I was, by the time my 10th grade year, I was getting recruited by colleges, South Carolina, Duke, uh, all the Southern schools, Clemson, all the schools that were there. And then the, then the NAI schools, because the, the unique thing about NAI schools at the time, they were as good or better than some of the Division One because players were coming into the country. You could have been a professional in the country that you were playing for. Uh, there was no age limit. So all these things cater to that, right? Cater to going to the NAI school, especially for the farm player. Um, and we played against some, you know, in college we played some. And they could have played professionally and then go back and get a good education as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, high school, I mean, I, I was, you know, all state, all city, uh, one of the top scores in the state and, you know, made all the state teams and, all those, all those different things going up, and you know, every year, right? Every year it was it was you know just trying to get better. And I just remember like my story is that when I first started playing, right, there was nobody that really played. And then we moved to the suburbs. There was one kid, uh, and he was my best friend for a lot of years. Like we had this, how our house was here, and then we had a hill that was our backyard, and then he lived right over to the left, and he had two trees in the backyard. And it was just big enough for the width of a goal. So we would play hours and hours and hours on end. We had put on the, we'd take turns. I'd put on the goalkeeper jersey and the goalkeeper gloves, which were just like baseball gloves at the time, right? Like a batting glove um, with some little nubbing things on the end of them, but nothing. And so we'd play soccer, I mean, hour on hour. And if he wasn't, if he couldn't play, the side of my house was a brick house, right? And the, um, and the fireplace stuck out. So I would work on hitting the ball against the wall, coming off different angles. Sometimes I'd be the goalkeeper making the saves. I'd work on shooting the ball, passing the ball, playing it in the air, getting the ball down. I mean, this, this went on. I did this once I started playing. Only way I didn't play soccer on a daily basis, if I was sick or if I was in trouble. That was it. That was the only way. And even when I was in trouble, my parents would stop me from going in the backyard and play because they knew that was my thing, right? I mean, literally, I mean, there was – I did that until I did that until I was probably 16 or 17 every day, every day, every day. And then once I got a car, you know, and girls and all that, you know, things start to change a little bit. But um, even at that though, right. Even at going to, going to, going to training and, and practicing and all those things. And those, I would still spend days. It wasn't every day. I still spend days working on things and working and working, working. Um, and then, I mean, it really came down through those years. Carl Rosenbaum was, and at that time, your, your, um, your high school coach could be your club coach. So he became my club coach, which had a certain number. You can only have like seven or eight kids from the same high school play. So, and I had him pretty much all the way through my high school. And I had, you know, I, when I played on state, when I played on the ODP teams, because ODP was very big, I had a different coach. And, you know, we would get some of the, 
former Atlanta Chiefs that stayed in town that would become coaches and we would and they would be on the state team, the ODP team and you know, go to go to regional camp, just like what, you know, go to regional camp and all that stuff and hopefully get selected. Um, and I was always in the mix. Uh, and then my, I, after my senior year, junior, senior year, things really got hot and heavy with colleges and, you know, I had my pick, right. And the thing that kind of stopped me a little bit, slowed me down, I had to I have dyslexia. So it's, one of those things that, you know, it's not easy as learning things, right? Not so much learning things, but reading things and seeing things. So um, my SAT scores weren't, weren't the greatest, but uh, because I was a minority, uh, partly, and because I was a good soccer player, I got an affirming university. Uh, that's where Clint Dempsey went to school, Ricardo Clark went to school. And if you think about the school, um, it's considered the Ivy, an Ivy League level school outside of the Ivy League. That's those are sort of the grades that you have to get in, and I got in right. And um, I mean, I mean, barely. I'm sure that I mean, I'm sure I know how I, I know how things work. I mean, it's I mean, every school gets certain number of exceptions. I'm sure I was one of the exceptions, right? Uh, but I'm not complaining. Uh, so um, you know, that was that was one of the first life changing experiences of my entire life, going to Furman University because. Uh, as Atlanta began to change, right? When I first started, when we first moved to Atlanta, you know, blacks were the minorities in the community. And then as the city changed, blacks become, became more of the majority. So then when I went to Furman, um, I think I was the first black player to ever play at the school in 1985. Um, and from there, um, uh, playing at Furman, it was it was a unique experience in a lot of ways. The soccer was good. One of my best friends, Ozzy and Roberts, uh, who I just spoke to a couple of days ago, he used to be the uh, technical director for Wales. Uh, now he's the technical director for Morocco, uh, and he's you know a great friend of mine. I met him, and you know, there's other guys. There's other guys that we're still friends today. But you know, financially, it was a life changing experience because at that time, I mean, we were going people that went to that kind went to that school. Their families were you know super well off. I mean. In the sense, when I'm talking super well off, one of the kids, I believe, you know, his dad was the president of Exxon. They were at our school. So, uh, you know, I came from a very middle class family. My dad was, um, my mom was a stay at home mom for the most part. And then my dad was uh, a store manager for Sears. You know, he, he did fine. We did fine. But not at that level, right? Uh, where, you know, you, you know, at that time in the 80s, Kids were driving BMWs and, you know, and Bentleys and all those, you know, whatever, those sort of expensive cars. I'm driving my Nissan Sentra. And so, you know, that was, that was a life-changing experience. But also, but also what that did for me, it said, hey, there's a different world out there than you've been growing up in. You know, you have a chance, right? And that's what soccer did for me. And, you know, all through college, I was one of the best players on the team my freshman year. I think I was player of the year, freshman of the year. I led the, I led the, um, at the conference in scoring and I think even today I'm still in the top 10 in scoring in our at, at the school history you know some I finished school in 1989 so that's like <laughs> that's a long time ago but that's got to be 30 40 years ago it would be yeah Oof. that would be you know 30 some odd years ago 30 30 35 years ago and that record's still there um and, you know, John Tart was my coach and, you know, John wasn't much older than us. He went, to, he, he went to, he went to Furman and then he, he got the job a few years later. I, John wasn't much older than us. He was, he was a young guy, but he really tried to help us and he tried to teach us and tell us about being people and, and connecting. And, um, that was, that was, that was an important time. That was that was life changing because I got a chance to get out of Atlanta and experience a, a new way of life, meet new people that I would have never met, played at a level that um, that was very good, that really pushed me, um, and you know met some lifelong friends. and And then another changing point was, you know, after I finished soccer, soccer was dying, right? Soccer was really dying. NSL had folded, MISL. The indoor league was was going down. There was a new league coming up called Asia AISA or something like that. The indoor league. Uh, Keith Tozier, that name's pretty prevalent today. He was a coach of the team in Atlanta, um, and 
uh, you know, there's a bunch of guys that played and um, I trained with, I was training with him, training with him. And then uh, a coach that I had played against in college got a job in Albuquerque, New Mexico for the New Mexico Chile. This is 1990. Um, and in 1990, he says, Hey, come out. We want you to play. I'm like, I just wanted to play, right? I wasn't ready to get a job or anything like that. I just wanted to play. So I went out to Albuquerque, spent a couple weeks out there. Never been to Albuquerque, right? Funny story was I had never been to the Southwest until like maybe like two weeks prior, three weeks prior, because um, I was, we had a, there was a big indoor tournament for, uh, and, the, and the reserve team went to, play in the tournament out in Phoenix. And I went with the reserve team to play in Phoenix. And so that was my first real experience out in the Southwest. And then a few weeks later, I'm moving to Albuquerque to play for the, uh, play for the New Mexico Chiles. And again, going into a whole different culture, right? It was a very Hispanic culture. Uh, the food is unbelievable in Albuquerque. There's all, oh, gosh, I start thinking about it now. I mean, and it's really New Mexican food. It's not really Mexican food. It's not the Tex-Mex thing either. It's like, have these red and green chilies, patched in Mexico chilies, and the food is awesome, right? And that was a great experience. Um, our fresh, uh, my first year there in 90, the, the league was, what well, people understand, the league was massive. It was the APSL slash A League. And between, it was divided into two, East and West, and we're in the Western Conference. There must have been 30 teams. I mean, I mean, along the West Coast, San Diego had a team, LA had a team, San Jose had a team, Portland had a team. Uh, Vancouver, Seattle, all, I don't know Seattle, I think Seattle might have had a team um, in the league, um, Seattle team, Colorado had a team, Colorado had a team, so it was in Denver, El Paso had a team, you could go on and on and on, and the East Coast, you know, many of the MLS cities today, they had teams, and it was, it was an East and a West 30, 30, 30 some odd teams, right, Baltimore Bays, they were very, very good. A lot of Africans. They were they were um, at the time when Howard University was really very big. That bought a lot of Africans, Caribbeans, and it might have might have been the time they had won the national championship. It could have been a few years earlier in the college level. But that first year was 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 unbelievable. We had we had some very good players. Some you know had a few guys from UCLA. We had some players from the Mexican League that had come up and played. Uh, Nazi Obias, He was one of the one of the very good players at the time coming from Mexico and uh, Seattle was dominant. Um, you know, the LA teams were okay. San Jose was phenomenal. I mean, that was, I think John Doyle was on the team. I want to even say uh, like Jeff Beicher and these kind of names that, you know, these guys were all on the team uh, at the time. So very, really very good. And uh, then my second year in, in the league, playing in New Mexico, playing for the Chiles, we actually made it to the semifinals or the quarterfinals of Open Cup, which is, you know, Open Cup was always a big deal, and we were, we were very happy about that in 92. Um, I just continued playing, and then as I started to play, right, I started getting, I was getting into coaching, right, and uh, from the coaching aspect of it, um, I was doing some coaching, I started coaching at a club called uh, Albuquerque United, if you're involved in youth, you might have heard of that club before. Albuquerque United um, had a, a Welsh guy, Yayan Griffith, uh, was the was a director, and he really taught me a lot about So I, I learned the details about soccer, right? I learned the details about how to teach technical, how to teach tactical, how to teach, how to teach, how to be a coach but be a teacher. He really, really was different level. I mean, and he, he was a, he was a big time guy and, and, in um, in the Welsh football development, um, and he he really taught me a lot, and I really I mean I owe him so much, uh, and so that's with him I started you know I coached at a young age you know young teams when I was in high school, and, but really he was the one that said that made me say this was I always knew I wanted to coach, but he's the one that says wow oh, there's so much more and you can you know you really can do it, and I really just started just you know in the off season I coach you teams during the season I try to coach you teams and do some trainings and um and then um I started doing my coaching licenses and by the time I was 25 or 26 I had my A license and um 
there came a, there came a time when MLS, you know, after the '94 World Cup, um, I was pretty. I was I was doing pretty well coaching. Right, uh, we had just come off. I was coaching the. Uh, I I started coaching the Mexico Chiles in ninety five or 96 somewhere like that and we took a we had a very good team um we won our we won the western conference B, bp el paso team which was like an unbelievable rival we had never beaten el paso uh they came up to our place it was a two-legged affair most goals win um and we we beat them at our place right but you know you win the game i think we won one nothing or two nothing so really that's not a score not overcome going to El Paso I don't think we'd ever won in El Paso right and so we go down and I think we went three nil in El Paso uh, so which was which was unbelievable I mean we're we're celebrating El Paso like it's like we're just celebrating jumping around and um, then that was the we were the Western Conference champions we beat in the semifinal we beat San Antonio. So San Antonio had a team like, you know, this, this USL team in San Antonio now. We beat San Antonio. And then that became the sizzling, I think the sizzling six or sizzling eight or something like that. All the teams that had won their conference, uh, won their division rather, had, they then went to um, Long Island, New York. And we played in a, uh, the sizzling six or sizzling eight. And San Jose was there. I remember Long Island had Neil Engel. I think Chris Armas was on the field. Um, and then there was a Carolina team that had a lot of Duke players. Carolina Dynamo, maybe, I think they were called. Um, and uh, our first game out, we played Long Island. They crushed us like 3-1. I mean, they were, they were really very good. And the next game, was it? No, first game of San Jose. First game of San Jose. And San Jose beat us like four or five nil. You know, they 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 hammered us, and then we lost the next game to Long Island, the Rough Riders. Um, we lost that game, but for us to even get to that point, you know, because San Jose had a huge budget, right? They were from the Bay Area. They had a huge, massive budget. Um, we had a very small budget. We didn't have we didn't have much of a budget. Um, but to even to get to that point, that was, that was huge successful. And then, you know, I was still young and fit and, you know, could still play and MLS was ramping up and I had to kind of make a decision. Am I going to you know, continue chasing it? I was felt like I was moving in the right direction with coaching. Uh, now what I, what I know now I would have gone and played. Right. But for me, I had a family at the time and um, to go and make, Five, ten, twelve thousand dollars. Just couldn't, just couldn't really make that decision to do that. And I was making a ton of money coaching, you know, because you know I was coaching the pro team, coaching youth, and I had my own camp business. So in camp business at that time was probably raking in gross, you know, eighty to a hundred grand, right? Even at that time, so it's like I didn't really want to give up all that uh, to go chase five or ten grand now. And obviously, going back, you wish you would have with the way the league is now, right? Uh, but um, it was, you know, and I continued my coaching. And then uh, as things go, New Mexico Chile's folded. But right away, a team called uh, uh, ownership group, Jean-Marie Pfaff, if you remember that name from a long time ago. He was a Belgian goalkeeper. Uh, he was one of the owners. Um, and... Uh, guy to Dallas and a guy out of uh, San Francisco, Terry Fisher. Uh, they bought the team and they called them Albuquerque Geckos. Uh, and this was 97. And um, we, we spent some money. We, and for that time, we spent some money. We had a player that had come from Argentina that had played with Diego Maradona and at Boca Junior. So we had Jason Batty, who was a New England, uh, uh, New Zealand national team player, went on and, I don't know if he played in MLS. He might have played in MLS, but he was he was San Jose's goalkeeper coach for years, and I was coaching in the NWSL. I think it's a goalkeeper coach for NWSL. He's had a few different jobs in MLS too as a goalkeeper coach. Um, but we had some top-notch players. Will Stratty, who was um, Stratty in the group, then maybe had a few guys that were national national team kind of players. Um, but 
funny story. We started the we started the season. We were down in Phoenix. That was our first game, uh, and I want to say Greg Vanny was in that team. Uh, I can remember correctly. I'm not sure though. Um, but first 15 minutes of the game, the game just ebb and flow, and had a Scottish guy in the midfield with the Argentinian guy. This our, the Scottish guy jumped on, said something to the Argentinian guy. And, Next thing you know, those two guys are brawling and the Argentinian guy knocks the, punches the our player in the face, right? And and we lose two players, right, in the first 15 minutes of the game. Uh, and we go down, you know, we lose that game 3-0. But then after that, uh, we kind of pulled it together, suspended the guys, did some different things. And um, we won them in 13 in a row. We won 13 in a row and then uh, – we went on and won the championship. We beat, uh, I want to say we, we played uh, uh, maybe Harrisburg, maybe Harrisburg in the semifinals, and we beat the Charlotte Eagles in the final, like 4-1, oh. 4-0, four, four, no, yeah. So, so it's funny, even back then, you hear these names, those, those names are still around in the game, right? So I think many people don't really understand the history of the game, right? Understand – there's a lot of culture, a lot of history in the game, but there's it's also a big graveyard of teams too, right? Uh, because I played in, I played for the New Orleans Gamblers, Riverboat Gamblers, who Mike Jeffries, who coached the Dallas Burn, Dal Shore was on the team. Dal Daryl Shore coaches in Lansing, one of the teams in the USL one. Now I can't remember which one, uh, but he was a he was an assistant coach for Real Salt Lake for a long time, uh, for a lot of years. Um, but and that's the area where um, um, from the gamblers, uh, Jason Christ came from that area uh, down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. His family lived down in Baton Rouge. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was the, the journey has been something. And, and, you know, and there came a time that the interesting thing was is uh, and so I coached in 97. I coached in 98 with the, with the geckos and then geckos moved to Sacramento. Uh, which we'll come back to the story a little bit later. They moved to Sacramento, the same ownership group. Um, so then I took a job in South Carolina with the South Carolina Shamrocks, which is a team in Greenville now. So South Carolina Shamrocks, they were right in a town called Spart Spartanburg, which is about 30 minutes north of Greenville. Um, so there's even a team in that area now, which I never thought a team would come back to that area. But, you know, I went to school in Greenville at Furman. So, um, but... And then there was, a, there was a little bit of a stretch. I was out of the professional game for a while, probably from – had a chance to go to Cruz Azul, um, to do some youth coaching in Cruz Azul, but just the timing wasn't right, and I wasn't really that sh sure about living in New Mexico City. I went down and uh, – What's that? That would have been interesting. To, to yeah, that would have been interesting, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I look back on it. I mean, I, I wish I would have done it, but, you know. Uh, I got in there because the guy I coached with the Geckos, the last name is La Bastida. His family was very powerful in Mexico, and his brother sat on the board at Cruz Azul. His uncle ran for president right before Vicente Fox. You know, so it's been a few election cycles that have gone past since then. But so I was able to get into Cruz Azul and, and meet the people at Cruz Azul through them. Um, and I was going to do some do some youth coaching for them, be in their academy for them, and to work with the first team um, a little bit. So, but that didn't that didn't that didn't uh, pan out. And then probably from 2000 2001 to about 2000 probably six or seven, I was out of the pro game for for a long time. Um, and then um, I was n n always knew that's, I mean, that's my, that's my, that's where I do my best work. My situation, we'll jump back to that story, but my situation is, I, it's been very unique for me because um, I'm one of the few coaches that have worked in youth development, that have worked with reserve teams, that have worked with, and led the first team. So, and I like them all. And I enjoy them all, but I feel like I do my best work with the professional players uh, just because of my personality. My personality is 
is really what you see is what you get. And it's sometimes not easy to do that with young players because you're dealing with the parents, right? Um, so, but, and, and also my ability to communicate with professional players and also to my, my ability to make relationships with, with professional players. I feel that I'm really, I'm really open. I'm really wanting to know about uh, their lives, their home life, their personal life, their needs, their hurts. And you can't necessarily do that. And I believe that's part, I believe that that is part of me as a coach. I can't necessarily do that. I, I have a limit with younger players because they're kids, right? Their kids. So, and I think that takes away from my overall coaching, whereas at the professional level, I can, and I'm also good at the professional level, you know, having that line that, you know, no matter, I might have come to your, I might have been sitting in the hospital with you while your wife had the baby, uh, and, or I might, you might have, I might have kept your, my wife might have, we might have come over and picked up your kids while you were at the hospital because your wife's sick. But if you can play, man, you're going to play. If you can't play, you're not going to play, you know, and, and you can older professional players can, can see that and understand that youth players can't see that and understand that. Uh, and so I think that takes away from my coaching a bit. Um, and I tone it down some with youth players because it's development, right? They're learning, they're growing, they're developing. Um, but yeah, that um, jumping back to being out of the game, you know, that was, that was difficult for me. I mean, I, I, I love, I thrive on the pressure of the professional level. I love the fact that every single day I walk onto the field, I have to be better. And if, and if I'm not, it's a problem. Let's elaborate on that pressure that you're talking about. I think you've been in the professional game coaching and playing. I think for some of the audience, they don't understand what you're discussing about pressure. If you can give us some... Uh, experiences you had in that uh, in that world that you're like, wow! I thought pressure was just winning, but there is more to that on certain areas that you, know, you coach that you're like, this is pressure. This is pressure, and I, you know, it's kind of it goes to an extreme of even life situation. So, can you elaborate on that? What uh, what you mean by pressure in the professional game as a coach? Yeah, I mean, first off, I mean, no matter what owner, no matter what any owner tells you, no matter what any sporting director, technical director tells you, there's only one option every time you show up at the stadium, and that's to win. That's the only, that's the only option. You lose, there's an issue, depending on how big the issue is going to be. If you draw a game that uh, that you should uh, that you should win at home or you draw a game that keeps you out of the playoffs there's issues there's issues why are there issues because at the end of the day this is an, this is sports is entertainment sports is a business an owner injects lots of money into a club he tries to find the best players, the best coaches, the best medical staff, the best uh, ticket salespeople, the best of everything. That's what the money's for. So it's not wealthy people aren't wealthy because they throw money away. Wealthy people are wealthy because they make money and they find avenues to make money. And that's what, that's the premise that we have to work with them. Um, they love they, they might love their community. They might be very community conscious. They might really pour, pour millions of dollars into different charities, but they got to make money. They got to make money, and uh, that's where the pressure comes. And then the pressure comes from the fans, not so much because the fans don't really pressure me as the coach. The fans are so vitally important to sport it's people don't understand, right? Without the fans, there's nothing, all right? Without the players, there's nothing. And the reality is without the ticket sales people, there's nothing. So all of it is important. So I have these discussions all the time, what's more important? They all are important. They all have a part to play. They all have a, you take one away, it's not whole. That's, that's basically what it comes down to. So if the fans aren't happy because the team's not winning, are they coming to your 
to your soccer camp that's making you money? Are they sending their kids to your soccer camp? Are they buying season tickets or are they buying game day tickets? Are they buying hot dogs or are they just coming to the city? All those things tie into the money situation, right? You know, from TV to sponsors, all that ties in, right? And if the team is not winning, there's questions to be answered. So you, as a player at the professional, need to understand that. You, as a coach, need to understand that. And, you know, some of my foreign experiences have been unbelievably crazy. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in situations where I've been walking through the store where the team hasn't necessarily done well that game or been on a bad stretch. And people want to stop and talk. I'm grocery shopping with my family. And they want to stop and talk. And they want to have their opinion heard. Uh, there was one time I was pulling out of a, uh, out of a gas station. And I, I, had stopped, I stopped. I was on my way to training. Uh, and I was getting in the car. And some people noticed I was the coach. They parallel parked right behind my car so I can't leave. And they say, coach. You got to change this. Team's not doing well. I'm, I'm getting in the car, you know, because you just don't know, right? You just don't know people, right? And they, I, said, I said, look, I'm always willing to talk. Come to the office, right? Come talk to me. I'm, I'm always open. So, you know, that, that's not an easy situation, right? Uh, so that's pressure. That's pressure. <laughs> so, you know, but I thrive on that, right? I thrive on, for me, good is not enough. Good is not enough. Good is the enemy of the best. Good is the enemy of being absolutely excellent. So, and I learned that, right? I, one thing I learned that I, I really, what really stuck with me really, once I stopped playing, I started doing long distance running and I was running a marathon. And it's my first one. And I got to like mile 16, 18 and my body's just like absolutely toast. I'm just like, how am I going to pick, take my next step? Right. Um, and that's my brain sort of saying, well, you know, how many people run 16 miles? How many people run 18 miles? How many people run 20 miles? You're, you're right up there in the top of those. But it, for me, that wasn't enough. I charted to finish. So I finished, you know, and that's just, and from there, it's like, for me, that was my best, right? I was never going to win that marathon, you know, cause those people were, <laughs> you never running in under three hours. I was done. In, I think I ran like 336, which my first one, I thought that was good. Right. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I live on that, that good's not enough. Good's not good is good. is just not enough. Um, it's, it, you, you, you gotta be the best. If you're not striving for the best, you're second best. Um, so, you know, jumping back into my time being out of the game, um, 2007, right? 2006, 2007, Timbers, Timbers, Portland Timbers are going through transition. Uh, and I just say, I, I got to get into the game. I don't know anybody at Portland, right? I don't know a soul at Portland. I send my CV, I send my resume to Gavin. First, I sent it to, um, I said, I just sent it to whoever the president was, whoever the, whoever was going to look at the resumes. I was going for the, I knew the job was open. I was going for the head job, right? Um, I didn't get it. Gavin Wilkinson got the job. So I, I, I once I found out, I wrote Gavin <laughs> right away. I said, hey, here's my resume. I've been in the game for a while. And I knew, and I, I, and he was, I didn't know this, but he was looking at just overhaul everything because they had a, a bad stretch, right? And he was going to be the head coach and general manager. He writes me back. I'm like, oh, okay. So he writes me back. Um, I don't know it. I don't know Gavin. Uh, and I come out to Portland. He hires me to be his assistant. And so that sort of started my modern, of the modern teams of today. So I spent uh, 2007, 2008 in Portland. Before we, but move, past that, before we move past that, why, if we can quickly kind of touch base on why did – not knowing Gavin, why did he hire you? Why did, uh, why were you 
choice? Why did he respond back to you if, if, if you guys had a well, dialogue on that? I mean, I, I think the thing was is because he was looking at two things, right? I was directing, I was a director of a youth club in Atlanta at the time. And he was, uh, he, had, he, had, he had just helped to start, he had merged two youth clubs on the east side of Portland. So he was looking for a guy with my experience that was willing not just to come in and be the assistant, but willing to come in and take a role in the club too. So I took a role in the club east side United, now they call east side Timbers with all the partnerships. Uh, I took a role there plus the assistant coaching role. And for me, I didn't care what the role was at the club. Um, I don't mean that in a negative way because whenever I take a job, I take a job and I think I've been pretty clear that good's not enough. I give my best all the time. Uh, but I was not, uh, I was not satisfied. Right. I wanted to, so it was my way back into, it was my way back into the professional game. And, you know, Gavin Wilkinson for me, I mean, he was a, he was a very I, I enjoyed Gavin, right? Difficult guy. I don't know if I mean diff, could be difficult, right? But to be a leader of a club, you can't be easy, right? You can't. We saw that with the Last Dance, right? Um, people have different leadership styles and different way of going about it. But uh, Gavin had played at the Timbers. Gavin was a uh, New Zealand national team player, um, and my demeanor because I understood what it meant to be a, um, an assistant coach, right? And he was very, very tough, very difficult, very – so I just – I knew how to take on the demeanor that was going to be different than his. And so that was a good mix for us, right? Um, first year we were freaking one penalty kick away from going to the finals, right? Uh, the first year. And then the next year we didn't uh, – I think we lost on the playoffs, but we had made a lot of change. We spent, we had made a lot of change. Uh, a lot of players went on because we had some successful year. Players got bought up and moved on, and we didn't. Portland at the time didn't have that kind of money to bring bring the players in. Um, so, um, and and again, I always knew I wanted to be a head coach, right? So, and even when I got hired, I explained to Gavin, you know, I always want to be a coach. Here, I'm not taking anybody's job. But so in, at the end of the 2008 season, you know, I was planning on coming back and then a bunch of jobs opened up in the USL and I got the job at the Cleveland City Stars. Um, I was in the running for the, the Real Hawks job, I mean, all the way down to the end, but I didn't get it. And then uh, I was, then I got the, uh, I got the job with the Cleveland City Stars and that only lasted a year. I mean, typical graveyard situation of, um, of professional teams, right? The year before they had done well in the, because it was the USL one at the time and there was a lower league and they had just won the USL lower division. Uh, Martin Rennie was the coach, who's now the coach at Indy, Indy 11 in the USL. Um, and he took a lot of the players with him and we didn't really have the money to refurbish it, but I didn't really care. I was a head coach and I felt that I could do a job you know, but we were playing, I mean, at the time, um, at the time you had Bob Lilly was in there with Rochester, who was powerhouse. Nick DeSantos, a coach in Vancouver. Uh, he was a coach in the league. And you go on and on and on. Brian Smetzer was coaching Seattle, you know. So, hey, the, the league was loaded, right? It was 2000? No, maybe not. Maybe Brian. I don't know when Seattle went to. Seattle came into. I don't know when Seattle came into MLS. I can't remember. But. It was um, – so I might be wrong. I could be wrong about the Seattle situation, but I, I'm not quite sure. Um, and then we had Portland. Portland, you know, Timbers with Gavin was still there. And, um, and then Manny Lagos, who's in with Minnesota. Amos McGee, who's with Minnesota. So I'm just trying to wrap your brains on some of these guys that are in the league. Good, good, good coaches that are either now still in the league or had a, had a chance in MLS or still in MLS, right? So – um, it was really, uh, it was good to go. Right. Great. Yeah. So, um, but what I loved about, um, what I loved about Cleveland was that it was really the, the organization itself was the core of who I am as a person. Right. 
they were a group that they were owned by a missions missions organization, uh, and their focus was to use the game of soccer to impact culture and change lives around the world. Uh, and they have probably 30, 40 offices uh, that they do you know, soccer soccer missions around the world uh, that they just simply want to feed people, help people, help people be better, right? Uh, and that's really their focus. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we would have, we did, you know, the, do different trips around the world. And, you know, I went to South Africa with them right before the World Cup in 2010. Uh, we actually were, we got the okay to, to the, the technical director of, of the missions group was an English fella who got the rights to, got the English FA to let us teach the level one course, right? So for instance, I was in, in then FIFA, we, FIFA reached out to us because of our reach to let us license coaches uh, for the World Cup because obviously FIFA's selling something, right? And they wanted to make sure that African coaches, they could say, yeah, we've got all these, all these positive things they're doing leading up to the World Cup, right? So we went to South Africa and you know, we licensed, we, I taught the level one course uh, to African coaches, you know, in, in 2010 prior, right before the World Cup. So it was like January 2010, December, January 2010 somewhere along those lines before the World Cup came in the summer. Um, and that was, uh, that, was a, that was a great experience. And then the team only lasted a year, and you know, we thought we were going to come back. USL was in a, in a lousy place at the time. I mean, teams were dropping left and right. There weren't very many teams. Um, but you know, they, they forged through it, and USL has done an unbelievable job. I mean, I've been involved in USL somehow, some way since 1990. And now we're in 2020, you know, so a long time, right? Uh, I have so much respect and, and admiration for the USL and what they've done for uh, soccer in this country. Um, but 2009, uh, and I held on, right? I held on hoping that the team was going to come back. And then by the time uh, we ultimately decided that the team was going to come back, I was looking for a job and uh, a player, uh, by the name of Brent Sancho in, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, reached out to me and said, hey, I got a club he had played for. It. Brent had played in England. He played and played for the Timbers, played in different places. He says, I'm in, I'm in South Africa, as a matter of fact. He's calling me on my phone. I'm like, who in the world is this calling me? So he leaves me a message, and I call him back, and it's Brent saying, hey, we want you to come coach our team in Trinidad and Tobago. So that was kind of my start to international journeys. Um, I went down. Um, and it was one of the biggest clubs there, um, Northeast Stars. And uh, the guy, there was another club there. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, Did you ever go to to uh, Shaka Hibla? I don't know Shaka personally, no. Okay. Yeah. I, so he never Sorry. came during the time you were at the stent? Never. I know he, he, it was past his time as a player, but yeah. uh, just coming in? Yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't um, – I never, I don't remember meeting Shaka, but I could have, but I'm just that kind of guy that, and I hate to say it, I mean, I don't get sort of impressed by anybody, and sometimes I might meet you and I might forget I met you, because I, I just try to treat everybody the same, respectfully. If you are messy, I'm going to treat you the same if you are Joe Blow on the street, right? That's just, that's just my nature, right? Um, but... Um, but yeah, and that was that was an experience, right? And uh, we played against a few different clubs. And um, what was the Concacaf guy's name that was from Trinidad? That he was like the he was like the VP of FIFA, and he was in all the corruption stuff. What was his name? Oh, I know who you're talking about, but the the name's not coming to mind. Yeah, but in, yeah. Anyway, he owned a club there too, right? And funny story was. He was pretty much the only club. I think he – don't quote me on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he was the only club that owned their own stadium oh, wow. in the country. Because everybody else played the – the country had built, you know, national stadiums around the country, and we played most of those games. And some of us played in smaller stadiums in our cities, right? But all that money <laughs> came from <laughs> all, the other, all the other bad things that he was probably doing, right? 
I mean, FIFA put the turf in. FIFA put the turf in that stadium for him. And but I can't remember the guy's name. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, I, I I love that because it's one one of my best stories is like at 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 one of our training grounds in Trinidad. Um, there was mango trees all around and different fruit trees all around. So the players, right after training, you know, would sit around and eat mangoes, and there was different kinds of fruits around. They send the rookies up the trees to climb the trees and get the fruit, and you need to sit around for a couple of hours, right? Just chit chatting, I sit around with the assistants, just eating fruit off the trees and just enjoying the Caribbean life, right? Um, but that was that was that was a great experience. I mean, it was the team had been on hiatus prior to me coming, or had been done poorly and. You know, the goal was to get into Champions League, and we didn't qualify for Champions League. Um, but, uh, you know, as difficult as – any experience is difficult, I still think it's a good experience, right? And there's, like, Brent. I mean, I just – Brent Sancho, we still stay in touch today, and that was, like, 2010, so 10 years later. Uh, we still stay in touch. And then from there um, – I went back to Portland, right? I went back to Portland to work with the youth, with the youth, uh, with the academy. I was part of the starting of the academy with um, with the Timbers when they went to the DA for the first time. So I was I was on the ground floor of that. Uh, and then I also with the PDL U U twenty three. I was working with the U twenty three. So the guy by the name of Jim Rylett. Uh, so I was there when John Spencer was there the first year in MLS, and then uh, I was there when Caleb first came. Uh, Caleb Porter first came, so got to know Caleb a little bit. And didn't really get to know John too much because it was just – everything was so crazy that first year, right? It's just like, you know, and trying to get the academy going, you know. So it wasn't a lot of time to hang out and chit-chat, and it was, wasn't that much going on and communicating between us and the, and the first team that much just because it was just, you know, first year and all those things, right? Um the first couple years anyway. And then uh, I stayed there uh, till like 13, 13. Yeah, I did that till 13. And then in, actually I was there through, through the end of 13. Around the end of 13, uh, Sacramento was coming into the league. Uh, and Sacramento was coming into the league. And um, Timbers and Sacramento were setting an affiliation. And that affiliation was to basically send players back. Much similar to what you see with Reno or Sounders 2, similar to those. But those the relationships now are, are different than what they were, you know, in 2014. So anyway, Gavin and Merritt and Caleb wanted me to go down and be part of Sacramento and manage that relationship. And I didn't know Precky at all. So, you know, we had to get Precky to buy in. And the crazy dynamic was, is Sacramento was also creating relationship with San Jose. So that first year Sacramento had San Jose and Sacramento, San Jose and Portland as their affiliation. Because from my understanding, this is all hearsay. So I don't want to offend any San Jose people, but what we had heard was is that San Jose was not interested until Portland became interested. And mm. then the league made sure that it worked out. Mm. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in any of those talks at all, but uh, that's what we were told. Um, but um, so then on top of that, I, I needed to assure Mark Watson, who was a coach at the time at San Jose, that I was not going to play favorites with, our Portland guys because I didn't know the uh, San Jose players they sent in to get games and all that stuff. So that took a few conversations with Mark and Mark was a good guy. Mark, Mark Watson was a good guy. And, um, he did a good job, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I stayed in touch with Mark and talked to Mark and uh, made sure that things worked out fine. And uh, that year, um, and now jumping back to the Portland, my first experience with Portland, guy by the name of Warren Smith was also running because Portland had a baseball team called the Beavers. I think it was the Portland Beavers or something like that. And Warren Smith, they, so they had a partnership with partnership with Warren 
and the, and the timber. So Warren ran the baseball side of it. Um, and Warren, when I first got the job at the Timbers, he was around the stadium. I never met Warren. And then fast forward, when Warren heard my story. Warren was now the, one of the owners of Sacramento. So very interesting story uh, there in terms of the ties and all that. And uh, 2014 was a special, was special, special. I, I probably had, I don't know, three, four conversations practically before I got there. I went in for the tryouts. Uh, I became the assistant head coach under Precky. Uh, and Precky and I just hit it off. I mean, it was a, you know, we just, and today Precky is one of my closest friends and I, you know, rely on him for a lot of advice and a lot of different things. Um, but he, um, how is Precky as a leader? Precky, I, I think the world of Precky. You look in the eye and tell you the truth and tell you how it's going to be, and it's up to you to decide how you want to accept the information he's giving you. Uh, he is tough. How, how does he tolerate if you don't accept it? He just moves on. He just moves on. He doesn't, he doesn't, there's no, the thing about how difficult as Perky is, there's no personal grudges. That he doesn't have anything personal. It's all about who's the best footballer, who can help the team, who wants to buy into what the team is doing. If you want to do that, we're all in. If you don't want to do that, no hard feelings. Uh, how much you're going to play all depends on how much you want to work. Uh, but I have, I've looked, I've shared this, I've worked with, I worked with a coach that had coached on the Brazilian national team. Uh, he was, he was on the bench when um, Brazil won the World Cup. This is the level of coach. Precky's at that level. He's that kind of a leader. He is really, he's that kind of a leader. I mean, he, he is, if you have kids, you'll understand. He is that tough leader that as a parent, no matter how tough you are with your kids, he, you make a way to make sure your kids always know you love them. You have the best interest in it. And that's Brecky. That's, that's his leadership. He's tough, but he always, but you always know that he is, has the best interest of you. Not just the team, but of you, um, and that's um, that's that's something that because of Preki, what his reputation precedes him sometimes. So you don't really necessarily get to know Preki that way. Uh, and what really showed me a lot was one of the very first meetings was we were somewhere, and this baby, someone brings a baby. Preki ignores all the adults, grabs the baby, and just showing all this love to this baby. It's like. Okay, that's not the pricky that people would say he is, you know. So for me, if a guy can take this baby and love this baby, doesn't even really know the baby, and the baby's just giving him all these smiles. For me, it's like that was like okay, there's much more there than what people see. And part of that is the coach, right? Because even for me, it's hard to get to know me as a coach because if you 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 have to set at the professional level people on the outside. It has to be uh, uh, there has to be this wall so that people just can't feel like they can just come in. And then because the reality is at the professional level, someone always wants something. For the most, I won't say for the most part, a lot of times, a lot of times the relationships that people want to forge with People at the professional level, it's a player, it's a coach, it's an administrator. They want something in return. It's not just like, hey, we are friends and I like you because of you. I don't like you because of your position. And that's, you have to be careful of that. You have to be really careful of that. So, so I get that from Precky's perspective. So in 2014, I, I mean, it was just, you know, Precky gave me a lot of leeway. He let me, I was in all the, you know, had a big voice in what we said and how we trained and, um, and, uh, you know, that was, I just remember when the schedule first came out and our first two games of the season was against Chivas at the time in the league and galaxy two. It's like, and we got these, what we consider ragtag bunch of guys, right. That we just kind of thrown together. Uh, I don't mean in a negative way, but just guys, you know, we, there were guys that were, Ended their career maybe 
thrown to the side or guys coming out of no-name colleges. One guy by the name of Emma Clemente, right, who was a midfielder. And I think he tried out maybe – I think he started as a – tried out maybe five or six times, right? And the only thing he ever got then was an invite to the two-week tryout, to the two-week invite trial. That's what he got. Emra now has gone – Emra – and he, he wasn't going to break into the midfield. So we lost an outside back. So we started trading Emra an outside back. And I can't remember which game it was, but he had a horrible, horrible, horrible training. We weren't even going to put him on the bench, I don't think, for, for that game. But the guy that's a regular starting right back got injured in training. So Emra had to start. And he – I mean, it's all just like – and then Emmer went on to be, I think, make all team that year. But even bigger than that, he his career has gone on. Give you a quick story. Emmer Emmer played at Sacramento. He had played the most games in the history of Sacramento, and now he's not there. So that someone else probably surpassed him. Um, signed with Galaxy too. Got picked because he's he's originally from Montenegro's family. Great story for Emmer. You know, they left the war. When they left the war, they, they migrated to Germany. Then they ultimately made it to the U.S., his family did, after the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. Um, and um, he then went on to represent Montenegro. He's got three or four caps for Montenegro. For a guy that only got invited to the invite tryout. You know, so... Uh, and then we picked up, you know, this guy, Ivan Mirkovic, played at a small little school... Kid played at Chico, couple kids played at Chico State, and you know, nothing really special, right? But we just put it together, and all we said is that, you know, everything that matters is it's all about us. It doesn't matter what anybody says, it doesn't matter what anybody does, it's all about us. We don't worry about anything but us. And that was our motto every year. And we started off the season up and down, up and down. And then I remember we went to we had this turning point. This we went to Dayton, Ohio, and Rochester. And it was a bear of a trip, I want to say. Uh, we go and we, we hammer Dayton, beat Dayton fairly easy. And then we got to make a trip to Rochester. And everything's against us. Rochester's like a top team, right? And we're just hoping for a split that weekend. Um, and we – bad weather comes. We almost get stuck in um, – we almost get stuck in – in Dayton. So we arrive, I think, in Rochester, like some crazy hours or something like that. And we play the next day and we win the game. And then from there, we just up, 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 kept climbing the ladder, kept climbing the ladder, kept climbing the ladder. And I think we finished second or third, right? Uh, I think we finished second or third in the league. And at that time, Orlando City, uh, was it, have they gone to Orlando yet? Yeah, Orlando, yeah, they had moved from Austin to Orlando. And they were the team, right? They were the team. They were going to MLS, and we were like, we were the new guys on the block, and uh, we're thinking, okay, we, you know, we go into our game, go into our – who do we – I'm trying to think who we played. But the big game was we played LA Galaxy 2, and um, we played LA Galaxy 2 um, in a game that we were down 2-0 in the 80th minute. And we won 3-2 in the 92nd minute. Wow. And I think, I think that propelled us. And Rodrigo Lopez, Roro, got, he got a hat trick in that amount of time. And we go on, and uh, Orlando gets beat. So we get the host in Sacramento. We're thinking, okay, we, we're, going, we're going to Orlando. We're thinking the whole time. Because Orlando's just run away. They, they led the league from the beginning to the end, right? Pretty much. The regular season. And so we're thinking we're going to Orlando. Harrisburg beats Orlando in the semifinals. And so we get the host. And we've sold out every game. I, this is like one of the unbelievable experiences in the sense of I go to Sacramento, right? I've, I've been involved in Portland, right? I've been involved in Portland, you know, been involved with the first year of MLS and all the sellouts and everybody's coming. And even in the USL days, there were certain games that you know, we would, get 10, 12, 15,000 people into the games. You know, when we played the Seattle's of the world or the Vancouver's of the world, those kind of, those kind of games, right? Um, and I'm in, I'm in Sacramento, and we're leading up to the first game, and we're playing at a 
we're playing at a stadium, a junior college stadium in, you know, in California, junior college facilities are unbelievable, right? And this stadium, uh, Sac State, I think, Sacramento College or something like that. Um, stadium was about 25, 22,000 people. And everybody's saying, oh, man, we, we're, we're going to get all these fans. I'm, I'm skeptical because I've been, I've been in the league a long time, and I've seen 100 people show up at games, right? Um, and, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I think we might get five. We might get 10. Oh, okay, yeah. I think we might get 15. Well, like, okay, yeah, whatever, man. I think we're going to sell it out. And I always like to get to the games really early. So it's about three, about three four hours for the game. I'm driving up. People are already walking to the stadium, are already walking to the stadium. And I'm like, okay, well, so we're in the locker room. We hear all this stuff. We walk out to warm up. The stadium's full already at warm up, sell out. And there was 22,000 people there at our first game. And the funny thing is, I think our first game was against Harrisburg of the season. They beat us. They beat us. Yeah, they might have beat us. Or we won, I don't know, it was a close game. But then we played Harrisburg in the final. We won 4-1, 3-1, 4-1, 5-1, something like that. Um, but unbelievable experience. In Sacramento, I love Sacramento. I love, I love the heat. I love the food. I love the people. Great experience. And then after Sacramento, right, Preki left. Second year, Preki, and you probably heard all the, the stuff about Preki maybe going to the EPL and coaching because and, he had played at Everton and all those things. And, um, so he left in July and then that was really kind of, for me, that was heartbreaking. Cause I, I was, because I was wanting to be a head coach. Right. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, Brecky's leaving. They're, they're just going to elevate. They, they, at that time, we phrase that we finished the year. I'm the Academy director. I'm thinking, okay. In the second year, I'm the Academy director. Uh, Brecky's leaving. I'm thinking for sure they're going to come to me and, Say, Rod, come take over, be the coach, finish out the year, and then we'll figure out what it was later. It never came to me. Uh, and that was, that was not fun. Uh, and then the guy they bought in, uh, he was just a guy that, for me, was insecure, was not uh, a guy that was not sure of himself. And basically anybody that had alliances with Brecky, you were on his bad list. You know, and you've heard these stories in football before, how crazy it is. So he's on his bad list. And I'm doing my job at the academy. I imagine, fast forward, I'm running the academy, our first academy trial, 700, 700 players at our academy. We, we rented an entire complex to have trials. And we got to dwindle this down to 60 players, right? So I've done, right? I've created U.S. soccer. It's like loving what we're doing with the academy, all these things, right? Building the academy. By the time the new guy comes in, we've already had like youth players called into different age of national teams, right? So this is how we're doing. We're just really just churning along, build something special. U.S. soccer is loving us. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be in. But, um, and this is, part of this is my own personality that caused some of the problems, to be fair, because I felt like I should have been the guy. I felt like I, I never say you deserve anything. Life is life, right? We don't deserve anything really, but I felt like, the opportunity would have been nice to be offered to me to, to do that. And uh, I wasn't. And uh, the guy, I think, I think the guy that came in, I won't say he was intimidated by me, but I will say this, that he, I was a precky guy and he didn't, and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be his guy. I was never going to be his guy. Uh, not because he didn't want it to be, because I didn't want to be his guy. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't have that same level of appreciation of his ability as a coach, his ability as, uh, as a leader. Um, and so I just didn't do the so that I could with my, um, with my coaching, running the academy and doing all those things. And um, at the end of the season, right, uh, I was looking for more. I wanted more. They weren't going to give me more. So... Um, I left and I don't, I didn't, if, if he doesn't come, I don't leave. So I really feel like he, even though I, I made the decisions that I made, I still feel like he, he wanted me out. He made it clear. I mean, he made it clear he wanted me out. He didn't want me to be part of it. 
Uh, but that's the nature of the business. I don't hold any grudges, but that's just a fact. I've never shared that story, uh, you know, because there were little things like um, instead of calling me as the academy director we're on the road to say how, how do things go, or I would call him and update him on how things were on the road, how the team had done, and who would play well, and potentially who we could maybe look at to bring in in training and all these things, and I would send reports. It got to the point where he wouldn't even call me. He would call, you know, coaches of the teams and speak to them and not speak to me. So that will, those were clear things that were, uh, my time was, was limited there. Um, but um, that's just kind of, that's just kind of what it is. Right. And, um, you know, it was a crappy thing too, because when I was the assistant, uh, Graham, who was the, so just let's delete that name when you go back and edit that. But the guy that was the sporting director, uh, he brought his son in to be the assistant head coach. So I was moved on to the academy director. So all that to me was just like a slap in the face, a guy with experience, a guy had won things, a guy had been loyal to Sacramento. So that was, that was a slap in the face that I didn't have the opportunity to at least continue uh, working at first team football level on a regular basis. Cause that's really why I went to Sacramento because Gavin knew that I wanted a first team football, not just to be, a, to be around it, but to do it every day. And that's why he came to me. He knew what I wanted. And the sporting director knew I was coming because I want, not because I had anything. My time in Portland, fantastic. Because still, Gavin's still a friend, his family, his wife, his kid. My boy's 13 and his daughter's 13. They still stay connected on social media. So that's the kind of relationship, right? So, and I still, I still root for Portland. I mean, you know, Portland's always going to be a place in my heart that I always pull for Portland and want the best for Portland. But I wanted first team football, right? I wanted an opportunity to do first team football every day. And uh, so, you know, bringing in, bringing in his son to take my place was really a slap in the face. Uh, but, you know, you move on and you understand the nature of football is a dirty game can be sometimes. But that's just what it is. Um, and, you know, after Sacramento, uh, the Jamaica thing came up. Uh, and with Jamaica, uh, Jamaica thing had come up prior to me going to Sacramento because right when I decided to go to Sacramento, Jamaica, Jamaica club had called me and reached out and wanted to know I was interested in going to Jamaica and said I had committed to go to Sacramento, so I, I didn't do it. And then uh, after things went sour in Sacramento, very clear, not sour with people like Warren Smith, who was the owner, people like the club, nothing would sell with the club. To this day, that place is very special to me. I still speak with Todd Donovan here and there, and uh, there's players still there that I have utmost respect for, people that still run the club. There's nothing sour about that, just simply how the fact that the technical side, the technical way that I was treated by certain people in that aspect was not appreciated. Um, and um, so after I was no longer going to be at Sacramento. Uh, the job came open again in uh, Jamaica, so I jumped at it, right? And Jamaica, Jamaica was a job that um, I really wanted because it was a big job. I was going to be a first team coach again, and you know they they were coming off of two championships. So how dumb is that in a way as a coach you go to a team that's coming off two championships, right? How are you going to make it three? I know they, were they coming off two? They were, yeah, they were coming off two, two back-to-back championships, right? And um, it was, but me, look, wanting the best all the time, wanting, wanting to reach a level of being excellent all the time. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't say no. And it was, and this was one of the first times, right? Because usually I'd travel and my wife and the kids would stay at our home base. But this time the family was going to go to go to go to Jamaica with me, right? So it's like I went for about three months uh, to check it out, and then the family came. Um, and um, it was a trying experience in the sense that the club had spent a lot of money prior, right? Um, and you know some of their better players had moved on because there were big players, a couple of players had gone to USL, a couple of players I think maybe got some shots in MLS and some players that went overseas. And so it's kind of a rebuilding year and the owner was in the place saying, I don't want to spend money. I want to bring in the youth. So I freaking made a young team, right? And uh, 
I got there like I'm kind of jumping around here, but I got there like the team was playing in Champions League because I won the league prior, right? So we were in Champions League qualifier, which Champions League qualifier, I use that term. So basically it was the Caribbean slash Champions qualifier. You win your area, two teams, because we would have had the two teams come out, you play in the final, then you're into the into the group stages of, of Champions League. So that's how that sort of that's how that sort of works out. Um, and it was um, had some big players, had some players, national team players. Uh, I was, I, you know, um, so it was, it was fun to work with that level of player, right? To work with that level of player is always like, it's fun. It's just, it's fun. It's exciting. It pushes you because they know a lot about the game and they're good and they only want to be better. If there's, if most players at that level, they want to know, can we win and can you make me better? Uh, but Jamaica was a, um, it was a tough experience because the money situation, uh, players uh, wanting to leave the club. And uh, so I tried to build that and um, we did okay. We didn't do great. We did okay. Um, and it just came to a point where the money became too difficult. I mean, Jamaica would have been a place I looked at, okay, this could be a launching pod to really now give my, cause it, my goal was to come in to win, to show my ability to get in the Champions League, to play MLS teams, to be, to beat an MLS. This is my personal personal goal, right? To beat MLS teams, to give to give myself a different platform. But never that superseded my belief and wanting to be the best I could for the club. I never, no matter everything that I everything I think about myself, and my wife sometimes kicks me for it. I'm always second. I'm always second. So yeah, I might want to be here but I'm not going to sacrifice anything if the team can't be there. It's not, that's not, that's not who I am as a person. Right. Um, and I always look out for the team first and the players first. And I even did things down there where I transferred our best striker, who was one of the leading goal scorers in the national. I transferred our best striker, sent them alone first to San Antonio. And then I sent them alone to, maybe OKC, and I mean, we got money out of it, right? And, and I think we got for him maybe, which is a lot of money in Jamaica because the dollar, I mean, 125 to one, right? So for every American dollar, 100, 125 Jamaican. I think we got 30, in the two transfers, we got 30, 30 40,000 US, which was a lot of money. Uh, and I think we did, so that, you know, so even at that, looking at what, I knew that was gonna hurt the team, but. It, to benefit the club, we transfer the guy, and he deserved to go to the next level, right? Don't get me wrong. He deserved to go to the next level. Uh, so Jamaica was a uh, was a good experience, and I would have stayed. The money was different, right? Because my kids were still young enough that they hadn't started. They weren't in school as of yet. My youngest one, my older boy was. Um, I would have, if the money was right, because, you know, the goal was – find a place on the beach, live on the beach, enjoy the Caribbean life, right? And, um, and, and do football and then do that for a couple years and two, three years and, you know, build a good platform. That would launch you other places, right? That would launch you other places. And that would launch players other places. And that would launch the club because my goal for the club was always to be a big player, right? To be the biggest club in the Caribbean, but be a big player in, in CONCACAF, right? That either – you know, that clubs, worst case scenario, clubs will come in to take your best players on a regular basis. That the, And you could always replenish it where the best players in the country always wanted to play for Montego Bay. That we would always have this replenishment because we were so good and we kept sending players on. That was the goal for Montego. But the money just dried up. The money dried up. The owner just chose to, you know, do what owner do, right? If there's money, and you know, no complaints there. So then I came back, right? We came back and... Uh, and, you know, I'm coaching and doing youth coaching now. And my goal is always to be at the professional level. My goal is always there. And um, I do consulting now with uh, right before COVID, I was going to be in Egypt uh, for two weeks working with a pro club to help them set up their technical structure, help them hire coaches. They had asked me to come to be the coach, but I wasn't keen on um, moving to Egypt. Um, but um, so I was going to I set in a consulting agreement with them to um, be able to come over two, three times a year, help them hire coach, train coaches at the academy, uh, help them, and then help them transfer some of their better players out and find other places for them, and, and you know, create some uh, international partnerships that would allow them to 
potential find bigger owners, find sponsors. Uh, and then, you know, cause I was already working on, you know, some MLS clubs that maybe partnered with them so that they would be able to pick up those players at basically no cost. Right. You know, but then the sell on fees and all that business side of the stuff. Right. Which I enjoy that too greatly. Uh, you know, there's some potential of other things that are in the works right now uh, on the professional level. But I love, I love the club I'm at right now. They treat me well. They do, they do. Uh, my family's happy. I mean, we live in an area where we live on seven acres and have lots of space, and kids get to run free. And you know, so those are those are all positive things. But I don't know if I'm have to be pretty old for that fire to coach at the professional level to go away. So no, I think. I truly appreciate you kind of getting thorough in your story and, you know, even sharing us some difficult moments in your journey as well. I think those are very intriguing because there are some coaches in the professional or even amateur or collegially have dealt with, you know, those moments as well. And obviously when they hear someone else has dealt with it, it makes it like, oh, that's interesting. At least I'm not the only one. There's people dealing with it. What I want to kind of transition and kind of um, what this podcast really revolves around is the mentality. I'm a firm believer uh, as a player, it's not about the talent that gets you at the ultimate highest level. As a coach, it's not about your tactician, how you coach, how the, it's the mentality. It's the mentality. Mentally, mentally, I want to kind of dissect with you. You've, you've coached in so many different countries. You've dealt with so much different uh, generations throughout your years of playing and coaching. If we can kind of first hit the player aspect, what are the qualities? What is it that you can be going, okay, you're at this level. Yep. Now you got to improve these stuff to get to this level. Hey, this is still, you, you don't have it yet. You've got to still develop this to get to this level. And then going on the coaching hat, how does, as a coach, you're, you're a person that wants to be at the professional. I know there's a lot of people, if it's professional academy with the youth side or even professional with the senior team, what is it that they need to be doing and how do they communicate mentally? How do they deal with those rejections and moments where you can even say doesn't work out and you keep moving up the levels? So if you want to first jump into it for the player perspective and then we can go on the coaching perspective, the mentality and the traits you need to kind of continue to stay on that path and have opportunities to get in there. Yeah, so that's a great question, right? Because for me, mentality is the ultimate separator at the elite level. And... It's the one percenters, right? It's the one percenters, right? That's that's what you're. That's what that's a different, different, differentiating factor. Because if we can use the last dance, right, uh, as an example, right? You take Michael Jordan's mentality. Um, his mentality set him apart. Was he talented? Yes. Were there bigger, stronger, faster guys in the league than him? Yes. Were there better shooters than him? Yes. I mean. Bird was a better shooter than him, right? But um, his mentality. And how do you get there, right? How do you get there? What I can say is you got to know what you want. You got to know what you want. You got to have a vision. You got to have goals. You got to have goals. And you got to do those things every day. For me, I have core values, right? I have certain things I do every day. This is me personally, right? Before I get out of bed, I pray. I read. I write in my journal and I exercise every day. Those are four things that I do before my day even starts. Every single day. You know, no one, no one really knows this, but I'm on, I'm on three years of running without taking a day off. Three years. Wow. And that is rain, snow, sleet, shine. Fair enough, I use a lot of the gym up in this area, man. <laughs> you know, I use the gym, but it's tough. Not, and there's no gyms now, but yeah, and the weather's decent now. So, but 
have core values and have goals. Look, I just have this dream, right? And I, I said, I'll I tell you something funny, right? And, and it affected me as a player. As a player, right? As a player, I used to dream of being and playing in Brazil in the World Cup. And then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I had a dream that I would be involved with a team coaching a team in Brazil in the World Cup. And when that did not happen, I was like, oh, whoa, this is, you know, I was disappointed. I mean, because I believed I could do that, right? I believed I could do that. So belief in who you are. So you got to believe in who you are. You got to have core values. You got to have a vision, all right? And I have a vision right now. I have a vision. I have goals right now, short term, long term, where I want to be, where I want to coach. And your goals cannot be something that you can grasp. Your goals have to be something that they're out of your grasp. Because if they're in your grasp, they're not really goals. And so for me as a player, because I have those goals, because I have that vision, because I have those core values, the rejections that you get, well, you're not going to get the job, or you're not going get, to get this contract. It just fuels the fire that I'm going to get there. And the day that I don't have goals to achieve and the day that I don't have vision, that means I'm going to sit back and relax, read a book, sit on the beach, and see life out. That's what it's going to be. That's me. And I believe players need the same thing, right? Because rejections, getting rejections and you having goals, you understand that's just part of the process. Getting rejections and having no goals and no vision, you think it's the end. And something I learned, right? And Cleveland had a lot of African players that come from some really difficult countries, right? Um, and one player in particular, I left him out of the team, right? I left him out, didn't, I don't think I started him, but anyway, he wasn't in the, he wasn't in the 11 at least. And I asked him why he was so down right after the game. He goes, well, coach, you know, when at home, when you get left out, it means you don't get paid, which means you don't eat. Yeah. So, you know, that was, that was like, you know, that was like eye opening for me. It's like, okay, okay, this is real now, right? Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is real. And to experience that. So then I had to learn how to communicate in a different fashion, right? Um, and I didn't even share this story. I know I'm bouncing around, but Sierra Leone, you see the movie Blood Diamond? Yeah. So I spent time in Sierra Leone after the war. And, you know, everything that you think of, you see the commercials on TV where kids playing with no shoes, kids drinking, bathing in the water that was in the dirty water with the animals that was Sierra Leone. And to go there and to try to better and influence the country, right? And influence the people, right? Because as I've shared many times, I want to use the game to influence and impact culture. So that was part of my vision to go there and influence and impact culture and help every player that wants to get out to get out. So when you go to those different countries, you find different mentalities. Players are playing because like I shared, this money pays for my food. And even have it in America, right? Even have it in America. Because sometimes I get bugged because I hear like, and nothing against any of this. Well, you know, the collective bargaining agreement, we need this, we need that. But are you looking at, are you looking at the kid that is 17 or 18, that he's working a job, that his food buys the family's meals on a weekly basis, but he's having to figure out how they're gonna pay $2,500 to play on a youth club. These are people with unbelievable mentality. This is unbelievable mentality. So, but they all have, if you talk to all of them, they want something, they have a vision, they have a goal, they see something at the end, right? And they're, and they're moving, as difficult that it is, as difficult as it is, they're moving. 
They're moving. They might veer here, they might veer there, but they're moving and they're going and they're trying to achieve. So if you're going to make it to the elite level, goals, dreams, visions, rejections are just part of the journey. Part of the journey. No, I mean, that's, that's powerful. And I love how you brought in even the Sierra Leone story because you go to those third world countries, you can't really show it to people in the U.S. because the U.S. is such a rich country. They don't know it. But the reason you said those visions, if those individuals in Sierra Leone, in the other third world countries, don't have visions, goals, they might not live. They might not live. And because of that, I, I'm totally in with you. There is no rejection. They don't, what, what, do you, what do you mean? If there's a rejection, I don't care. I got to push because I got to get out of here. So yeah. that was powerful. And I, and I wanted to kind of elaborate because our audience needs to know that that is so important. And if you're not living it, sometimes it's harder to dig, dig, dig and get that feeling to have those visions and it's okay to be rejected, but because maybe, you know, you're living in a very nice neighborhood, maybe mom and dad give you everything you've had and you have a safety, net, basically, let's just say you have a safety, yeah. net. you know, the world of football, you're dealing with these kind of people in third world countries that if you have a safety net, you're not willing to know what sacrifice is. So I, I totally get it. Because of that, in the world of football, you even said it. If you have family if you have, and you're like, I'm making this much as a coach. Even your playing career, you say, I'm making this much as a coach. Am I willing to lay out by the street for a few weeks? I mean, there's so much stories about some of these players that made it. It's like, um, it is a lot of that kind of things that, what is it that everyone's willing to sacrifice in the coaching world? There's so much... There's so much cruelty because it's yes. so, you can even say dirty in a sense because mm -hmm. it's the most popular game in the world. And by being the most popular, there's a lot of money behind it. When you have a lot of money, everybody wants a hand in that. And, you know, it's, it's that. But like I said, I appreciate that, Rod, so much. As we can transition to the final two questions is my last, uh, second to last question would be this coronavirus work, this pandemic we're in. Um, I think you even touched on it that you were planning to do certain things, but when it hit, it kind of put a pause to it. What what message from your perspective can we give our uh, families, our um, aspiring coaches, aspiring players that they can be doing during this current time to come out of it better, stronger, more efficient, more quality behind their uh, foundation than it was prior to going into it. Uh, if we can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the corona thing is, is difficult. Like my mom lives in Atlanta and she just found out she has it, right? And my mom's 70 something years old. Wow. Yeah, so um, that's, that's difficult, right? And I'm 3,000 miles away from her. Luckily, my sister's there and family's there, but she's not sick or anything like that. She doesn't have any, any symptoms. She's asymptomatic, which is fantastic, right? Um, she's about a week now in quarantine, so hopefully another week and she'll be free, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but for me, and I, me and my wife have talked about this a lot, you know, we really hope and we really pray that we will come out of this as better people. Because the last thing I would want to see, I would be so disheartened if we come out as a people. Like, I've been in quarantine for three months. I deserve this. I deserve this. We, we come back in a sense of we deserve more than we had before. You know, I really hope that people will do some self-reflection. I would hope that people would do some uh, reinventing of who they are and how they think. Um, and become more compassionate, become more graceful, become more merciful. Uh, understanding that we are different doesn't mean that we can't be unified. And something that really, one of my personal, I have about 10 
10 or 11 personal things that I use, I, I try to, I try to instill in myself in unity. And one thing about unity is I'm, I want to be considered a unifier, not because we believe politically the same or religiously we believe the same, or we like the same football team. No, we're unified because we're human beings, because we're simply human beings and we simply respect each other just because we're human. Not because you have more money, not because you can get me a job, not because you can do anything, but we can be unified. So anything I would say, right? Um, you know, and I, and I also try to consider myself, and this sounds funky, but I try to consider myself a hope provider, someone that can provide hope to others. So if, if, we can, if we can unify and we can provide hope, we have a chance. But if we can't unify and we don't have hope, we don't have a chance. I heard, I heard someone say this one time, uh, you can live so many days without air, you can live so many, you can live, you can live so many seconds without air, so many seconds, with, so many days without food, so many days without water, but you can't live one day without hope. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, great message. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, and then final, final question to kind of transition from that to this is it can go into any sports, obviously, uh, any sports. I wanted to have that free because everybody tied into it differently, but sometimes usually it ties back into football, soccer, because that's what we grew up playing. Um, favorite team of all time, favorite player of all time, and then kind of tied into how did that come about? Favorite team of all time? Wow, man. My favorite team of all time would be the Dutch team that won the European Championships. My favorite team of all time. That's like 90. What's that? that 70, 78. 74, 78. I can't remember. 78, 70. Okay. Okay. Um, Cruyff? First team, yeah. My favorite player of all time. Favorite uh, across all sports. I I'm going to give a few. Favorite American football player is Walter Payton. Okay. Uh, okay. Favorite all time basketball player, Michael Jordan. Okay. And favorite. Uh, all-time soccer player would be Messi, hands down. I, I saw play play. I love him. I love Diego, but Messi, his quiet, unassuming personality, but he will cut you in half in a second. And I love that. I love that. No, that's, that's, uh, it's funny how if people actually watch sports based on the three players you, you, you listed, Michael Jordan, Walter Payton, and Messi, I have a perception of you. I have a, I can, I, I can see what, because of the qualities about all of them, like as a uh, uh, philanthropist and human being, Walter Payton was, uh, uh, as a competitor, Michael Jordan was. The humility Messi has and the way he carries himself. There's aspects of them because when people say there's certain things, especially the deeper individuals, there's reasons behind it. There's not just because, oh, he just scores goals. There's reasons of that. So, uh, no, that's beautiful. That's beautiful on that selection. So I truly appreciate that. Um, and for our... Um, moment that we have here talking about the beautiful game i again appreciate the time you put in um in your busy schedule to kind of share with us um amazing stories amazing stories amazing experiences that i know a lot of people would love to hear and kind of during this time especially where i think there's not a lot of um shoulder rubbing you can do but is right. uh, but it's reading books, like you said, and listening to these kind of um, 
intriguing podcast that could be educational, that could be inspiring, that could go in so many different ways. So again, I appreciate that. And I want to kind of throw it back to you and any um, future stuff you have planned, anything you want to share, anything we want to be on the lookout, audience want to be on the lookout for. And uh, from there, we'll close it out. Yeah, excellent, man. I really, appre- I really appreciate this. Um, this is fantastic, right? I mean, and it's, it, you know, one thing I always like to try to share my story, right? And I mean, that's really, I mean, I, I didn't even really share like, you know, how it was being a black coach and, you know, I didn't even share all that stuff. And I just didn't just because of, uh, just because of what's happening in the world today, right? You know, the fellow getting killed just the other day and the guy that was running just not too long ago, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. I don't like to get into that stuff, but you know, I just share, I'll share this one story. I mean, when I first started coaching, right, literally until the, until the referees knew who I was, they would walk past me and talk, but even, wouldn't even, uh, wouldn't even stick their hand out to shake my hand. They would immediately go to my assistant coach who was white and would assume he was the coach. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've got a lot of stories like that, and I would have a lot of questions for U.S. soccer because they really haven't done a good job in really integrating the minorities, right? Uh, but that's for a different day. No, I mean, I think uh, I definitely agree with you. I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to always dissect with the minority, but – for what you kind of expressed to us today uh, and what you shared, it was beautiful. I think there was a lot of uh, very deep conversation that um, I truly appreciate you opening up. And um, thank you again. You're welcome, man. I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Anything you need, anytime, let's make sure we stay in touch. I mean, uh, I'm always available. I'm always, when I say I'm always available, I'm always willing to share, help, uh, speak to better the game. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah.